we're going to talk about the question of why do we as human beings believe in divine beings? Why do we believe in divine beings? And especially in the light of the fact as it is stated in 1 John chapter 4, the 12th verse, nobody has ever seen God. Yet, we believe. And this is the question we're going to treat tonight. Now, in, in Christian theology, we, we recognize two types of discourse. The first one is called special revelation. And that would refer to information we gather about God from our holy scriptures, which would be the Bible. And then theology also recognizes a second type of revelation. And that is called general revelation. It is knowledge about God that we get by just looking at nature, at the earth, and so on. And this is in theology based upon Romans 1 verse 20, where Paul declares, ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So these are the two types of discourse found in theology. Now the problem, of course, is sometimes the Bible itself even contradicts itself. I'm sure you know about this contradiction. I'm not going to talk about it. If you would like to talk about it, we can do it later. And the second problem is that revelation through nature also contradicts the Bible, of which the most famous example, of course, is the theory of evolution. When we look at the story of Genesis, which was written as a creation in seven days of 24 hours each, we cannot in any way make it compatible with the theory of evolution. And of course, this is part of the problem we are living, living with. I would like rather to make a distinction between revelatory discourse in general and scientific discourse. And like I said, revelatory discourse explains our world and what happens to us by referring to beings in another world. God below, Satan below, and between, and in this battle, things happen here on earth. I would like to give you one example. When we look at Genesis 11, you all know the story. It's about the Tower of Babel. And it says, how do we make sense of different languages? And this story explains it. It says, well, at some other time, People decided they want to be as good and as great and as glorious as God. And they built a tower reaching up to heaven. But God decided, you can see a reference to a supernatural being, this is not going to happen. So what did God do? Well, God confounded their speech. And the whole project came to an end. Now, when I got to university, this is the story I believed. And uh, my professor in linguistics told us, no, 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 no. This is not where different languages come from. <laughs> the whole reason why we have different languages is because people lived in different environments. The Eskimos, for example, have about 22 words for various types of snow. In English, we have about two or three. So different environments 
is one of the factors which would cause diversity in languages and dialects and so on. So you can see we have two types of discourse which help us to understand the world we live in. And we find the same thing when it comes to the question, how do we explain religion? Because as far as we know, only human beings worship gods. I don't know of any animals who do it. I had a dog when he wanted food. He begged for it. That's the nearest <laughs> that came, came to worship. But human beings, we do worship gods. And, and we postulate various divine beings like angels, ghosts, ancestral spirits, demons, and many people will, will tell you, you know, I experienced this. Now, from religion, of course, there are many explanations of why we are religious. John Calvin, in the 17th century, as well as a modern philosopher, Alvin Plantinga of America, they said, well, the reason why we are religious is because God created us with a sensus divinitatis. It's like a religious capacity, much like an extra sense. And this gives us knowledge of God. Now, scientists say we, we don't like this explanation. Why not? Well, they say, we cannot test it with an experiment. You see, this is where the difference comes in between, between revelatory discourse and scientific discourse. Scientists want to do an experiment, and they want to say, look, this is how we do it. So scientists came up with other explanations. For example, uh, Feuerbach, a uh, uh, German philosopher, as well as Sigmund Freud, the famous uh, psychologist at the beginning of the 20th century, they both claimed that religion was the product of wish fulfillment. We experience guilt and we experience fear because of our environment, insecurity. And they say, therefore, we project this onto supernatural beings to help us face life with all its difficulties. But again, this is a, a, a hypothesis which you cannot test. You, you cannot do an experiment and, and test it. It's untestable. And therefore, the new and relatively uh, fresh approach of evolutionary psychology attempts to investigate the problem in a novel and in a new way. In his Origin of the Species, Charles Darwin wrote the following. In the distant future, I see open fields for far more important researches. Psychology will be based on a new foundation that of the necessary, necessary acquirement of each mental power and capacity by gradation. Now he's writing in Old English, I'll explain to you what he means. Applied to religion, this approach only took off in the 90s, at the beginning of the 1990s, in the previous century. And the theoretical framework within which this research operates is that our brains, as we evolved from simpler life forms, developed some devices which help us to control our environment and to survive and to procreate successfully. For example, when we hear a noise. Let's say we alone in our garden in the evening, we hear a noise. And we deduce from this noise, well, it's a robber. He's, 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 he's somewhere in the bushes. And we say, well, this is not for me. 
we run inside or we take out a pistol and we say come out or I'll shoot or do something like this we connected a sound to an agent it, we don't know whether there was an agent perhaps there might be an agent and that person would then surrender or it might have been the neighbor's cat but we survived if we didn't have this device in our brains and it was a dangerous intruder we would have lost our lives and we would not have survived so you can therefore see that the hypothesis is that the detection of agency the connection of an event to some or other agent forms the basis of this cognitive uh, psychology and the investigation into religion. I'm going to refer to only four devices. And the first device is called theory of mind. I already gave you an explanation or an example of that. Theory of mind, it means that we can deduce, we can, we can form a theory of an agent which might be behind a noise. Okay, that's the first one. And, and we'll have a look at it right now. Heider and Simmel performed an experiment which is extremely interesting. They, they made a little film of this big triangle there and a little small triangle there moving around a circle. And they asked people, react to this. What do you think is happening? Most most people said, well, this big triangle is a bully. <laughs> this small one is a timid person. They both male and they're pursuing this female. <laughs> well, I think it shows us two things, you know, people think, think in terms of agency as well as they've got something on their brains, but that's it. <laughs> So the interesting thing is it illustrates the point that we tend to personify, to, to ascribe agency even to ordinary objects. That's the point. And when we look at, for example, religion, we find that thunder and lightning in ancient Greek religion is personified as the god Zeus and people said you know what he did he threw his lightning bolts like spears against people who didn't respect their parents now my my grandmother had exact same philosophy you know I remember very well as a child eight years old I asked my grandmother in one of these high felt thunderstorms I said grandma what is this noise here and without any hesitation, she said, it's the voice of God. I said, well, that's interesting. What does God say? She said, God says you have to listen to your grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> and your parents and be a good boy and all these sort of things. So you can, and, and in fact, it's based upon various passages in the Bible where thunder is described as the voice of God. If you read the book of Job, various of the Psalms, you will see thunder is described in this way. It's a revelatory discourse. It, it makes sense of events by referring to supernatural beings. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, you know. It probably helped me to respect my grandmother more. <laughs> but scientists would not do it. They would say, no, 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 no. Thunder is definitely the result of lightning and it causes a sonic boom because of various processes it sends, sets uh, into, into place. And from this perspective, 
these psychologists say, well, you know what? The reason why we create supernatural beings in our minds is because we try to control our environment. We create these stories to help people behave and, and to make sense and, and to say, well, it, it's God's way of maintaining justice. And, and they call it hyper-agency detection device, meaning we may walk in the, in the garden and, and hear this noise and we may say in our minds, this is a dangerous criminal. The one I just saw on TV who escaped from jail, he's, wants to, he's got his axe in his hand, he wants to murder me. I ran away. I lock myself in the house. Nothing bad happens to me. I got away. But suppose I did not react to the noise. I didn't have the device in my brain yet. And it's really this criminal and he kills me. My genes, my stupid genes, will not be transferred to the next generation and therefore it will die out. So therefore hyper-agency is not uh, punished but rewarded. And this is the, the, the hypothesis why we believe in supernatural agents. This brings me to the second device. The second device is the ability to make a connection between a certain result and the reason for it. Now I'm going to refer you to the famous psychologist, those of you who studied education probably heard of him, he was called Jean Piaget. You know about Jean yes. Piaget? Yes, okay. Now he interviewed seven to eight year old children and he asked them questions like, why do we have mountains? Do you know what the children said? They gave a reason. They said, well, it's so that the lions can live there. And he would, he would ask another question. Why do we have rocks? Oh, well, you know, animals, they don't have hands. And sometimes they would like to scratch them, their, their skin. So they, they do it against the rocks. <laughs> so they gave a reason. They found a reason for it. And from this, the hypothesis was developed that this is a second device which our brains do have, namely the ability to connect a certain result, mountains or rocks, with some other reason. Whether it's correct or not, you know, it doesn't matter. This is what we do and this is how we make sense of our environment. And we struggle, of course, with the question, why are we here? That question is often, often discussed in the Bible. What are we doing here on earth? Is there some other cosmic reason why we as human beings developed to be here on earth? And the Bible itself supplies plenty of reasons. If you read the book of Genesis, it says, well, the reason why we're here is to obey God and to do things which God likes. For example, perform sacrifices. Read the book of Genesis. You'll see God likes the aroma of, of a good bry coming, <laughs> coming to him. It, it, th this is how we, people made sense of it, you know. And in Romans 1, Paul argues that the reason why we're here is to glorify God in all we do. And if we don't do this, the wrath of God will come upon us. What does Paul describe as the wrath of God? Homosexuality. This is, you read Romans chapter 1 and you'll see this is what he do. And uh, now, of course, we can test this hypothesis. We can, we can try to convert people to the right view of God from polytheism and then homosexuality should disappear. I'm not even prepared to go there because it won't work. <laughs> it, of course it won't work. So therefore, you, you, you know, we have to understand the limits of revelatory discourse. 
we, we cannot just simply accept it without critically examine it. That's the whole thing. So therefore, this second, this second device helps us to find purpose or meaning in life. Now, Pastor Rick Warren wrote a book which he titled The Purpose Driven Life. Most theologians criticize this book because he took biblical verses out of context, he strung them together, and he made very strange uh, conclusions from it. The Purpose Driven Life. It was published in two th before 2007. Now, guess how many books he sold? 30 million. 30 million copies. Can you see how basic attraction there is towards this whole notion of our life? There's a purpose in our lives. We're looking for it. Do you know the author, the Brazilian author, Paulo Coelho? You know him as well. He wrote a book, The Alchemist, which you probably read, The Legend of People. What is it all about? We all have a legend, a destiny, and we have to find it and follow it, and that will bring us happiness. Guess how many copies he sold? 150 million. You see, after tonight, one of you, you can write your bestseller. I'm telling you. <laughs> And you'll have to, you know, give, give St. George's at least a percentage of that, okay. <laughs> and it has been found that as people grow older and they they've got some more experience of life, they tend to move away from these sort of pre-scientific explanations of the purpose of life. But not a sub substantial number of people don't do it. And this is why we find, even in the Bible itself, the whole notion that people experience their religion in different ways. What did Paul say? say? And what does the book of Hebrews say? It's, it makes a distinction between people who are still in a milk phase and people who are ready for substantial food. So even the Bible makes this distinction, and it is fine. We, we, we shouldn't argue about it. But I think what we should do is to have tolerance and acceptance of people who do not accept their religion and their spirituality in the same way that we do. The moment we become imperative, imperial, we've got this imperialist thought, it destroys humanity, it destroys your society. I would like to give you a controversial example from the Bible. I hope it doesn't shock you, but I'm going to put it there as a fact, which is all of us grew up with the idea that Jesus is predicted and prophesied in the Hebrew Testament. His birth, the virgin will have a son, his death, his resurrection, and even his ascension. That, that is a notion that all of us has been brought up with. Now, scholarship, and I'm not even talking about modern scholarship. We, we know this since the 19th century, has established that there is not one single reference to Jesus in the Hebrew Testament. Not a single one. You can ask me about this later on, and I will tell you, read the context, you, will, you, can, you can see for yourself that where the New Testament refers to Isaiah 53 or any of these, it's, it's taking a, 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 a specific verse or paragraph completely out of context and reinterpreting it. And that's fine. This is how people thought at that time. They found destiny. They found um, a prediction that's being fulfilled. They found structure in history, and it helped them to cope with their environment. What do we do? We have new translation, the new international version, the new revised standard version, 
which, which we use in our churches, and they do not translate these passages in the Hebrew Testament as predictions referring to the birth and the crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. They don't do it. And theologians like myself who struggled with it, I feel I cannot tell my congregation. Look, the wonderful thing is that Isaiah 53 predicted Jesus' suffering. I can't do it because it's not true. So what I do is I do find expectations in the Hebrew Testament. And I say as a believer, these expectations for me as a believer are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's something different, isn't it? It's something different than saying, oh, you know, in this verse and this verse, and if we, we twiddle it a little bit with it, we find um, uh, references to Jesus. And th therefore, this device of making a connection between reason and purpose is also responsible for the belief that we find in the Bible itself. Namely, that sickness is caused by sin. Can you live with that? If somebody is sick, will you, will you tell that somebody, you know what, let's find out the, the sin in your life, or your parents' life, and we'll sort you out in no time. We won't do it. So you can see that the moment we, we put wrong relationships, wrong uh, 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 relationships between purpose and cause into practice, it can lead to terrible and inhumane treatment of other people. So that was the second device. The first one, theory of mind. The second one, the whole question about pur purpose. And the third one is the ability to read science. Have you ever even said it or experienced it? You know, I saw something today when I woke up. God gave me a sign. It's going to be a good day. We have this ability in ourselves to make sense of science. And it helps us to survive. If we walk in a bush and we see the footprints of a dangerous animal, the animal is not there, but we know, look, we've got to be, we, we, we've got to take care of ourselves. The ability to read a science. But it does not always work perfectly. Often I had to interact with visitors from Greece. You know, in South Africa, when we talk to one another, we've got this arm's length rule. We, we, we don't come normally closer than arm's length. Well, if it's your wife or your daughter or your son or your dad or what have you, you know, close family, there's something different the there. The Mediterranean yeah. people, they do not have it. They want to be close to you as possible. So they would come to me close and I would go back like this and they would become closer and I would go back <laughs> and one, one day a guy said to me you know you're very standoffish and I said you know yeah, I find you a little bit intruding and we started to discuss it and we realized we read signs differently we have different codes different conventions to do it this device is also applied to supernatural agency a few years ago, a rally happened in Van Abel Park. It was organized by a local pastor and potato farmer. He preached that homosexuality can be cured by prayer. You can pray the gay away. <laughs> he also says, only Christians go to heaven. No, even Christians. I mean, uh, s some churches say, you know, because you baptize children, you, you can't go to heaven. You know? Others say, because you, you, you have, you've got a different view of communion that we have, we won't see you in heaven. heaven. So, so who's going to be to heaven? But, but in any case, he said, only Christians go to heaven. I don't know which part of Christianity. And he also said, men should rule over their wives. Because this is what the Bible says. Now, when I got married, let me... I, I tell you, this was still the narrative in the church. My wife had to promise to love and obey me. She absolutely denies that it ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> a 
And she said, I had my fingers crossed. <laughs> but this is what, what he was preaching. He also says that when we have a drought, it is caused by sin. And when we have rain, it's because people subjugate themselves to God. Now, you know, when we think through this, let's think through this. It would mean that where there's a desert, all these people are definitely bad baddies. They're criminals. That's why there's a desert. And where we have, uh, 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 you know, lots of rain, like in Canada, where my children live now, yeah, all these people must be good. It doesn't work like this. You see, that's where it, 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 goes, it goes wrong. But in any case, at this rally, a cloud in the form of a heart appeared in the sky. This is how it looked like. And even the newspaper said, there is a sign from God that God blesses this rally, this man's message, and so on. He is absolutely right in everything he says. Apparently another cloud appeared, but no one referred to this. I don't know. Now, what, what do we make of this now? You know, if you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. You know? And uh, the moving of the embassy of the Americans from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, a fundamentalist friend of mine phoned me and he said, you know what? It's the fulfillment of the end time prophecies we find in Revelation and in Daniel and the whole Bible. Can you see, this is how signs are interpreted in a very strange way. There are people who make very important decisions in this way, like getting married, or starting a new business, or resigning from a job by practicing what is called bibliomancy. Do you know what it is? You take the Bible, you let it fall open, <laughs> And then you put your finger on randomly on a verse, and that gives you the answer to your question. One of my students did this, and he said he was absolutely disgusted by the practice because he, the first verse he, he pointed his finger at, at was Matthew 27, verse 5. Judas went and hanged himself. <laughs> He did not like it, so he said, Let give, let's give it the best out of three. <laughs> and this time, his finger landed on Luke 10, verse 37. Go and do likewise. <laughs> so I trust that these examples demonstrate how precarious and even dangerous it can be to just interpret a sign haphazardly to support what you're doing and what you're thinking. And the fourth one is the transference of structures in the family to supernatural agents. That's the fourth and final device that I'd like to talk about. It is the ability we have to, to transfer family structures to supernatural structures and to imagine these agents as maintaining family relationships on earth. Six million years ago, we as human beings shared an ancestor with chimpanzees. Chimpanzees, those who studied them, know they only, they're only able to live together in groups of about 80. You don't find chimpanzees living together in bigger groups. And if you ever went to a zoo, you'll, you, you, will, you will know that what I'm saying now is absolutely true. Chimpanzees, relative to humans, have no inhibitions. They are hedonistic. They are impulsive. 
They would, for example, defecate in their own hands, masturbate in public, rape a screaming female if the occasion presents itself, steal food from the elderly, ignore the cries of a wounded animal, and easily resort to violence. And at some stage, these behaviors promoted survival. But it also is the reason probably why they're not able to form groups of more than 80. But when we as human beings develop the ability to speak, to use language, it changed things. One of the first things I think human beings did was to gossip, <laughs> to tell a juicy little story. You know that man, watch out for him. He is not interested in, 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 in caring for an offspring. He's not loyal to his mate. He's not a good provider. And that would marginalize that person. And the family structure is the place where these values are shaped. And they are often transferred to supernatural parents who see what we do and who direct us in a direction. And this belief helps us to behave in manners which promote cohesion of larger social groups. In India, 1.4 billion people form a nation. My friends say, of course, there are a lot of problems. The biggest, largest democracy in the world, 1.4 billion people living together. And in religious activities, we call God a Father who is om omnipresent, aware of every move we make. Psalm 139 says to God, You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. So God then finally becomes a symbol, a family symbol for maintaining values in a community. I would just like to show you some slides here. This was found in Palestine. It's a picture, very old, um, uh, drawings on a jar. And it comes from the 8th century before our common era. And the inscription on this, this little inscription there reads, it's a blessing by Yahweh, which is the name of God in the Hebrew Testament, of Samariah and his wife, Asherah. You must not think that, you know, people had a unified concept of God in, 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 in Palestine of the 8th century before our common era, that's a wrong perception. So the, what, what it shows us is that, that this parental structure of a, a husband and a wife and symbols of fertility here as well help people to function together as a society. Now, we come to the question now of why do good thing, bad things happen to good people? Isn't it something we, we have all asked at some stage of our lives? Why did it happen to me? I try to serve God. I try to be a good person. And, and something really bad happened to me. These devices work together to help us cope with life's trauma. Jean Piaget told a group of children a story, the same Jean Piaget. And he said, two children, two boys, very naughty, stole apples. Never, none of you ever did it, hey? <laughs> right, good to hear that. One was caught, but the other one got away. And this little fu fugitive ran over a bridge which was dilapidated, it collapsed and he fell into the water. And Piaget asked the children, why did this happen? Those younger than eight years tended to reply that it was 
retribution. He got his deserts. Those older than eight said, uh, no, 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 it was the rotten planks. It was most definitely mechanical failure. And older people who experience that criminals do get away with their crimes defer punishment to a heavenly year after or a hell in the year after. And to make sense of events like these, all four devices which we discussed combine to work together. Let me tell you a story. On the 12th of November 2008, the 37 year old Justo Padron lost his life. He was a career criminal and he was allegedly seen breaking into vehicles on the Mikosuke Indian Reservation in South Florida. He had been convicted before for attempted robbery with a deadly weapon. He ran away from the police and he jumped into a pond behind a casino where he was promptly eaten by a nine-foot alligator. <laughs> and people said, you see, God does not sleep. <laughs> it's justice in action. There is some form of, 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 of structure of, of, of justice in the universe which keeps things on course. Now tell me, what do you make of the next story? Fred Toppers of Michigan. In 2006, he was released from jail after spending six years there for the assault and the attempted rape of a 13-year-old girl. He's not a nice person. Somebody we would like to invite over for dinner or introduce to our marriageable daughter. In June of 2008, he won a jackpot in the Michigan State's Mega Millions Lottery, $57 million. <laughs> now this incident doesn't sit comfortably with any one of us, does it? We feel, you know, criminals should not be rewarded. They should be punished. And, and I, I followed the discussion on the internet and some good and solid Christians argued, you know what? God gave him this money to punish him. <laughs> no one could be happy with $57 million. <laughs> I, I must tell you, I won't mind to be punished in this way. <laughs> so in conclusion, in this talk I made a distinction between revelatory discourse and scientific discourse. And I try to show that they are often in tension. There is a tension existing between the two, and we shouldn't try to be disdaining of the one or the other. I refer to four devices which our minds developed helping us to survive. Firstly, the ability to form a theory of mind. Secondly, the ability to establish a relationship of reasons behind certain results, our purpose or destiny. The ability to read signs and the ability tra to transform family relationships to supernatural beings whom we maintain society. I finally refer to the way in which our brains combine these devices to make sense of trauma and loss. And I also alluded to the dangers of blindly following these devices to operate. Don Cupid, he, he is a professor of religious philosophy at Oxford. I think he's retired right now. And Lloyd Gehring, he was a Presbyterian professor at uh, Victoria University in Wellington. He's also retired. Don Cupid wrote a book, Taking Leave of God. And Lloyd Gehring wrote a book, Christianity without God, in which they argued that, you know, the whole concept of God is, is created by human beings, and, and really we don't need that any longer. But both of them said, well, seeing that it's so ingrained in our brains, it is time for us as enlightened Christians to reimagine God 
as a symbol for all that is good. Inclusivity, accepting people of a different sexual orientation or race or look or behave differently than we do. Openness to dialogue and conversation, our integral connection with all of creation, with the air we breathe, with the animals, the plants, and so on. And we are not special, they argue. And they also argue that we should leave all types of superstition behind, miracles, demonic possession, everything like that, we should embrace general or natural revelation. What do we do if we take this perspective seriously that supernatural beings are one of the byproducts of evolution? You decide whether we are able to function without somebody watching us, without assuming that our lives are predetermined, without the belief that things happen for the good, without the notion that we believe that what we believe about God makes us happy or unhappy. You decide. I'm not trying to give any final answers. What I'm trying to do is open yourselves up to discussion, open yourselves up to various viewpoints, be tolerant and take part. However, my own research and approach to life is based upon an alternative translation of the first verses of John's Gospel. You know it. In the beginning was the Word. It may also be translated differently. In the beginning was the conversation, and the conversation was with God, and the conversation was God, and in the fullness of time, this conversation entered into our flesh. I hope that I opened something of a conversation with you tonight. Thank you for being here. <laughs>